After Jennifer had been released from police custody and heard that Mero had given birth to twins, she became as mad as a bear with a sour head. That boy, who calls himself John, had the temerity to lock me up in police custody for almost three months. I will deal with him and his family. What will I do now to ruin their marriage? Jennifer started thinking of what she would do to cause havoc in Mero's matrimonial home. Suddenly, she reminisced that Mero gave her a gown and she also forgot her paints that she hung in the bathroom that morning. She left Jennifer's house angrily. Thereafter, she called Faroa, and when Faroa came, Faroa, I have a job for you and I will pay you handsomely to deliver the job perfectly, said Jennifer. Mama J, I am ready to carry out any mission. Just tell me what you want to do and I'll deliver it, Faroa replied. I trust you, Faroa. Go to this address and meet the owner of the house. When you meet the man, tell him that his wife paid you two million nara last year to sleep with her and get her pregnant, so you're no longer interested in the deal that you came to claim the twins because they are your biological children, said Jennifer. Mama J, this job is not too clear because there is no strong evidence that would make her husband believe me, said Farah. Hold on. Here is the woman's gown and pants, and this is fake two million naira in this nylon bag. Show the man the gown and pants, and also make sure that you show them this fake money so that they would know how serious you are. Farah, if you show the man this evidence, I guarantee you that the man would believe you beyond a reasonable doubt, said Jennifer. Mama J, you're a game mistress, expect results. But when should I go for the mission? Farrow asked. Go on Saturday morning. The man would be around in the house that day, Jennifer responded. On Saturday morning, Mero and her husband were just discussing their travel plans before Farrow arrived. Elizabeth, I will be relocating to another village with my wife and my children between Monday and Tuesday. So we've put this house up for rent, but my wife and I have agreed to give you the boys' quarters to stay with your family until you build your house. Not only that, we've decided to give you my wife's shop and this check for 500,000 naira, said John. Oh my goodness, is this real? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ma. God bless you people for helping a poor girl like me. Elizabeth appreciated them. Elizabeth, continue to be a good and faithful girl so that God will continuously shower you with his blessings, said Mero. While they were still discussing, their gate man named Emeka walked in and said, Ogre, someone wants to see you. Who's that? John asked. Ogre, I don't know him, Emeka replied. Okay, let me come and see the person. Honey, were you expecting anybody today? Mero asked. Not at all. As soon as John stepped out, Mero followed and stood by the door. Good morning, bros, Pharaoh greeted. Morning? I don't seem to know this face. Who are you, please? John asked politely. Bros, see, I didn't come here to answer your questions. Your wife here knows me very well. Last year, your wife gave me two million naira to sleep with her and get her pregnant, so I came to claim the twins because they are my biological children. Madam, here is the two million naira that you gave me. I am no longer interested in the deal. I want my children. Hey, young man, calm down. John turns to his wife. Honey, what's going on? John asked suspiciously. Babe, I don't know what this guy is talking about. I have never seen him before, let alone doing business with him. This is Jennifer's handiwork. She has started again, Mero murmured. Young man, you just heard my wife, so go back to whoever sent you to come and destroy my family before I get you arrested right now, John commanded. Bros, don't stress yourself too much. Just hold on. Let me show you my proof. Your wife forgot this gown and these her pants in my room. What? Mero, how could you do this to me? John asked sadly. Oh, Jennifer has finished me. Honey, 
It's not true, please, I can explain. Mero exclaimed. Mero, explain what? What do you want to explain? I remember this gown because I bought it for you. See, if I hear one more word from you, I will strangle you right now. John replied furiously. Hey, hear me. I am coming back in the next seven days to carry my children. I am Pharaoh. No man born of a woman can take what rightfully belongs to Pharaoh. Therefore, if I don't carry my children on that day, blood would flow. No one dares Pharaoh and goes scot-free. I am not afraid of any military, navy, or police. I will be back in seven days. Pharaoh responded, threw the clothies on the ground, and walked away. Mero! So, this was what you did to get pregnant? You had the guts to pay a notorious criminal to sleep with you and get you pregnant? Mero, I am done with this marriage. I am filing for divorce on Monday, said John. Please, sir, calm down. It hasn't gotten to that extent, please. I don't believe your wife could do that, but try and listen to her, please. Elizabeth begged. There is nothing this woman would tell me. If she didn't sleep with the guy multiple times, how then did the guy get her gown and her pants? John asked. John, I know you won't believe me because of what happened in the past. I gave that gown to Jennifer when I was in her house because she always admired the gown badly whenever I wore it. And I forgot those pants in a bathroom. I hung them the night before the morning that I hastily left her house. Honey, please don't allow Jennifer to ruin our marriage. But if you don't believe what I said, we can go for a DNA test for clarification, said Mero. I will never go for any DNA test. As far as I am concerned, you've slept with that man. If you could have the mind to drug and force me to sleep with Elizabeth and to also conspire with Jennifer to kill me, that means there is absolutely nothing you cannot do. I can't waste my money to go for any DNA test. I am fed up with this marriage. Mero, please, kindly go inside. Pack your belongings, carry those bastards, and leave my house this moment before you send me to my early grave, said John. Elizabeth and Mero begged John badly. After he remembered everything that Mero had done in the past, he couldn't control his temper, so he went inside packed all the children's belongings and threw them outside. So Mero kindly took the twins and drove sadly to her elder sister's place. The next Monday, John was about to go to court to file for divorce, and after Jennifer's housegirl named Susan heard that John was about to divorce Mero, she quickly came and said, Please, sir, I heard that you want to divorce your wife because of what happened between her and Pharaoh. Sir, your wife is innocent. Jennifer, my madam, paid Pharaoh a huge amount of money to play the game. She intends to ruin your marriage. Susan, thank you very much. But how did Pharaoh get my wife's gown and undies and the two million naira? John asked. Sir, I saw when your wife gave my madam the gown, and I was the one who carried your wife's undies that she hung in the bathroom when I went to clean the bathroom the morning that she left my madam's house. After I took it, I gave it to my madam so that she would give it to her, but I never knew the two of them were quarrelling. I heard clearly when my madam gave Pharaoh the cheque and your wife's dresses as evidence for Pharaoh to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that your wife truly slept with him. So please, reconcile with your wife speedily and confront my madam and Pharaoh with immediate effect before they fashion another attack, because my madam swore that she would leave no stone unturned until she ruins your marriage, said Susan. John appreciated the girl, so from there he went to Mero's elder sister's house. When he got there, he narrated everything Susan said to Mero, her sister, and her husband's sister, and he eventually apologized to Mero for his actions that day. John, I hold no grudges against you. I have forgiven you, but I won't marry you anymore 
so go ahead and file for divorce. John, I have passed through hell since I got married to you. I can't continue to marry a man who doesn't believe and trust me. It's crystal clear that we were not destined to be together. As for these twins, as soon as they are weaned, I will give you the boy and carry the girl and move on with my life. I am tired. I don't want to die before my time. Mero replied courageously. Mero, listen to me. You quitting your marriage is not the best decision at all. Initially, you were the cause of everything that you and your husband are facing currently. Assuming you didn't share your family problems with your so-called best friend, she couldn't have had any access to your matrimonial home. You made the biggest mistake by disclosing your family's problems to your best friend. And it is based on the information you gave her that she had access to destroy your family. Probably, you thought she was truly your best friend. That was why you trusted her so much. My dear, not all that glitters is gold. Just because she smiles with you every day doesn't mean she wants the best for you. Have this at the back of your mind. Genuine people are as rare as a hen's teeth, so be extremely careful with whom you share your problems, especially your family problems. Running away from your problems won't solve your problems at all. Instead, you're nourishing the problems. Tackle them now and leave no stone unturned until they are solved. What's happening to you is a family challenge, and there is no family without challenges. So don't allow anybody to flatter you that there is a family without challenges. Mero, follow your husband to your matrimonial home, stand firm with him, and tackle your family challenges courageously. May God help you and your husband to surmount these destructive challenges, said Mero's sister's husband. Thereafter, Mero and her husband reconciled, and after the reconciliation, Mero's sister said, John, sue Jennifer in court before she causes more havoc in your family. Madam, I don't have time to sue her. I am leaving this village very soon with my wife and my children. But I will arrest her as soon as possible, John replied. When they got home, John called the police to go and arrest Jennifer. And when Emeka, John's gate man, heard that John was calling the police to go and arrest Jennifer, Emeka hurriedly called Jennifer and told her to run away that John was calling police to arrest her. Because Jennifer had paid Emeka, John's gate man secretly, to tell her everything that was going on in John's house. And he had been the one who secretly gave Jennifer all the information in the compound without John and Mero knowing. So before the police reached Jennifer's house, she quickly drove out to another village. A few days later, John summoned Emeka and John's driver, Chris, to inform them about his traveling. Chris and Emeka, I called you people here to inform you that my family and I will permanently relocate to another village anytime soon. You guys have been serving us faithfully for several years, so I want to appreciate you guys with these tokens. Chris, Take this 200k, use it, and take care of yourself and your family. Emeka, this is 150k, use it and learn a trade or start up a small business. After they appreciated John, Emeka went inside and called Jennifer and told her that John and his family were planning to travel another village. So when Jennifer heard that, she called Farah to go and kill the twins. The next evening, John and Mero went out, and as soon as they went out, Emeka called Farah and told him that John and his family were going out. So Farah and his gangs attacked them on the road. Farah was looking for the twins to kill, but he couldn't find them because Mero didn't carry the twins. They kidnapped Mero and John. They took Mero to an incompleted building and chained her on a chair, and they took John to a bush and tied him to a tree. After they were kidnapped, Chris, John's driver, hastily drove to John's house to carry the twins and run to Mero's sister's house. Faro and his gangs were on their way to John's house to kill the twins. Suddenly, Emeka called Faro and told him that Elizabeth and Chris 
were running away with the twins to Mero's sister's house, and he called the name of the area for him. Farrower and his gangs quickly took a shortcut to meet them, and they truly met them on the road. While Chris was driving, he noticed a vehicle was pursuing him, and when the car was extremely close to him, he realized it was Farrow's car, and he increased the speed of the car. While he was driving, Elizabeth said with great fear, Chris! Chris! Please, I beg you, in the name of God, take this way that leads to the military checkpoint, because chances are excellent. That Farrower and his gangs would catch us if we continue to go to Madam's sister's house. So Chris quickly turned the car to the road that leads to the military checkpoints, and Faroa turned his car too and continued to chase them, and he was extremely close to them. And when they got to a junction, Chris speedily crossed to another road, and when Faroa wanted to cross the road, he never knew that a trailer was coming speedily on the road by his right, and as he was about to cross the road recklessly, the trailer crushed Pharaoh and his gangs, and they all died instantly. When Elizabeth realized that Pharaoh and his gangs were dead, she said, Please, Chris, let's turn and go back to our Madame's sister's house, so that these babies can eat and rest on time. So Chris turned the car and drove smoothly to Mero's sister's house. The next morning, Mero's sister, her husband and police officers began to look for John and Mero thoroughly, but they couldn't find them. Three days later, John and Mero were still not found. At midnight, a hunter saw John in the bush. Who are you? The hunter asked. Please, sir, help me. I was kidnapped and I have been tied to this tree for almost four days now without food and water, John murmured so the hunter decided to untie him from the tree and took him to his house. As soon as it was morning, John appreciated the hunter for everything and said, Please, sir, I want to go home right away. My family must have been crying because of me, and I don't know whether the kidnappers have killed my wife and two-month-old twins or not, so please, I want to go. I will come back and see you sooner or later. Please. Thereafter, the hunter took John to a park and paid for his transport. When John reached home and got the shocking news that Mero was nowhere to be found, he cried out heavily because he thought Faroa had killed Mero. Six days later, Mero was still not found and everybody was thinking that Mero was dead. The next morning, there was a certain farmer named Abegi. Abegi was returning from his farm located deep in the forest when he started feeling like defecating. He then saw this uncompleted abandoned building. He hurriedly entered the uncompleted building. As soon as he got inside, he saw Mero sitting lifelessly on the chair with chains all over her body. She was as miserable as a wet hen and extremely feeble and strengthless. So when Abegi saw her, he was extremely shocked Abegi hastily picked his cutlass and repeatedly struck the chain. He then cut the padlock that Pharaoh used to lock Mero. After he unchained Mero, he carried her on his back for about two kilometers until he got to the road. He flagged down every car passing until a good Samaritan woman stopped to help. Please, ma, can you help us to the hospital? I just rescued this woman from what looks like a kidnap situation, said Abegi. The good Samaritan woman assisted in putting Mero in her car. They rushed Mero to a nearby hospital. When the doctor requested money to buy drips, blood and oxygen for her, the good Samaritan offered to foot the bills. Two days later, Mero began to regain her strength and she was able to talk gradually, so she asked for a phone to call her husband, John. John was on his way to burn down Jennifer's house after he went there several times to arrest her without seeing her. As John was about to enter Jennifer's compound to burn down her house, he got a strange call, and when he picked it up, Hello, honey. Where are you? It's me, Mero. I borrowed this phone to call you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, babe, is that your voice? 
please, where are you? John asked in desperation. And when Mero told him where she was, John drove swiftly to the hospital. When he got there, the doctor approached John with an update. Sir, I have good news. Your wife is out of danger now, thanks to the timely actions of Mr. Abegi and a good Samaritan woman. John's face flooded with relief. Thank God. What happened exactly? Mr. Abegi found your wife in a terrible state and quickly brought her in. But it was the mystery woman's quick thinking that saved her life. John ran his hands through his hair. I don't even know how to thank this woman. Where is she? I need to express my gratitude. The doctor shook his head. She didn't leave a name or number, I'm afraid. Wanted to remain anonymous. But surely there must be some way to contact her. John insisted. Abegi stepped forward. Sir, the woman did instruct me to give you this. He handed John an envelope. John opened it to find a handwritten note and a stack of cash. His eyes went wide. 100,000 naira. But why? She said it was in case any other expenses came up for your wife's care, Abegi explained. Wanted to ensure you were covered. John was dumbstruck. I... I don't know what to say. Please take this money back. It's too much. Abegi waved him off. The woman insisted. She wouldn't take no for an answer when I tried to refuse as well. After a moment's thought, John relented. Very well, you keep it then to cover your transportation and any troubles. Thank you, sir. Abegi took out a pen. Here, let me give you my number in case you need to reach me about the good woman. As they exchanged contacts, John could only wonder about the identity of the selfless stranger who had saved his wife's life. A few weeks later, John, Mero and their twins succeeded in relocating to another village. After they relocated, Emeka was about to travel to his town to start a business. Unfortunately, he entered the wrong bus, and on his way, bad boys robbed everything from him, beat him badly, and emptied all his bank accounts. Six months after John and his family relocated to another village, Jennifer's husband, Evans, who was based in the city, came back to spend time with his family. Evans was a successful businessman. He had three children, but his wife, Jennifer, only gave birth to a girl, and the girl was with Evans in the city. Jennifer never knew that her husband had two children, because Evans hid the children from her. So after Evans acquired a mansion in the city, he came back to relocate his wife Jennifer to the city. Honey, you remember I told you to be patient, that I would come back and carry you to the city when I acquire a mansion? Evans asked. Yes, I remember and I have been desperately waiting for you because I can't wait to relocate to the city," Jennifer replied. Okay, I have successfully acquired a mansion and I am relocating you to the city this month, said Evans. Wow, but what you did is unfair. You acquired a mansion and you didn't even bother to make it known to me on time. I notice you always keep secrets from me nowadays. Jennifer murmured. Oh, I am very sorry. The truth is that I wanted it to come to you as a surprise. That was why I didn't make it known to you on time, but I am sorry anyway. Evans apologized. It's okay. Apologies accepted. How is my daughter doing in the city? Jennifer asked. She's doing amazingly great. I miss her so much. I can't wait to see my only daughter, said Jennifer. Sure, you would see her very soon. Honey, there is something I want us to do, said Evans. What's that, honey? Jennifer asked. Okay, since I am relocating you to the city permanently, I want us to sell everything we have in the village, Evans replied. Okay, that's not a big deal, but are we selling this our house? Jennifer asked. Everything. House, lands, cars, your shops, and the properties we have, Evans replied. 
Jennifer agreed to sell all their properties in the village. Three weeks later, Evans and Jennifer sold all their properties. Two days to their traveling, Evans said, Honey, transfer all the money you have in your account to my account so that I can now run a joint account and as soon as we reach the city, we will open a joint account for us so you can also have access to all my money and your money. She was a little hesitant, but on hearing that she will have access to all the money her husband has, Jennifer happily transferred all the money she had in her bank accounts to Evan's account. And Evans also told Jennifer not to carry many clothes, that she should carry one small travel bag, that there was a variety of clothes in her wardrobe in the city already. So Jennifer gave her clothes to her neighbors, church members, and her friends. On their traveling day, Jennifer and Evans were standing in the park to enter the bus where the park was situated. While they were waiting for the driver to load the bus, a strange lady came out from a cab with a military man and she hugged Evans romantically in Jennifer's presence. Evans, what sort of madness is this? Who is this girl? Jennifer asked furiously. Jennifer, hold on. Evelyn, this is Jennifer, my ex-wife, the lady that I told you about. Jennifer, this is Evelyn, my wife, Evans replied. Evans, I don't get it. Who is your ex-wife? Jennifer asked confusingly. Jennifer, calm down. Let me reveal some deep mysteries for you that I have been hiding from you. I secretly got married to Evelyn five years ago after you insulted and abused my mum, and she has been with me since the year I relocated to the city. She was the reason why I didn't want you to come to the city, and so far, she has given birth to two children. Jennifer, I am sorry to say this, but you're not traveling with me because I never booked a flight for you. I did everything just to teach you lessons, so kindly go back to your father's house because you're not going anywhere with me, said Evans. Evans, you're joking. Oh yes, you're joking, said Jennifer. Babe, the cab driver is waiting for us, so can we just get out of here? Evelyn asked. Pretty sure, please let's go, please, Evans replied. Evans, stand here, you're not going anywhere. After I sold everything I have in my entire life, including my house and my shops, and transferred to you all the money in my bank accounts, and you want to dump me, it can never happen, said Jennifer. Jennifer, was I not the one who gave you all the money to acquire all these things you are talking about? The house and cars were mine, so what's now your problem if I decided to sell my properties? Evans asked. Evans? You must refund all the money that I transferred to you, else you're not going anywhere, said Jennifer. Jennifer, if I send you a dime, call me a bastard. You had the guts to call my lovely mum a witch and all sorts of negative names. You lured me to throw my lovely mum out of my house at night, and you made my family hate me with a passion. And you believe superstitiously that I can still marry a family destroyer like you. Do you know what I went through before I could reconcile with my family? Jennifer, I promise you, until you die, you will never hear our daughter's voice, let alone see her with these evil eyes of yours. Out of my way, Jezebel, said Evans. Jennifer held Evans' shirt and said, Evans, you're not going. It's either you kill me here, or I will kill you. Hey, woman, keep your hands down and behave yourself, said the military man. Jennifer, let me warn you, if you dare touch me with your filthy hands, I will tell this soldier to embarrass you here. I hired him because of you. So kindly respect yourself and go back to your father's house to avoid public harassment. Baby, please, I am sorry to waste your time. Let's go. Evans and his wife Evelyn entered the cab and the cab driver drove them away. As soon as they left, Jennifer slumped, so people who were in the park rushed her to a nearby hospital. When they got to the hospital, they paid the doctor some money to treat her, and they left. When Jennifer regained consciousness, 
she discovered that her phone, expensive jewellery, bracelets, golden and silver rings and wristwatches were nowhere to be found in her luggage and handbag and she cried out because that was her only hope. After she miserably left the hospital, she went to her friends' houses and none of them could accommodate her because of what she did to Mero and John. In the evening, she went to one of her church members' houses and the woman accepted her. But when her husband came back, he asked what Jennifer was doing at his house. Honey, what is this lady doing here? Have you suddenly forgotten who she is? Honey, she was scammed by her husband. As of speaking right now, she doesn't have anything. So, please allow her to stay here until she gets an apartment. She replied, God forbid, she can't stay in my house. She might ruin our marriage overnight. Have you forgotten what she did to her best friend? Please, I am sending her out of my compound right away. He replied, Madam, with due respect, you can't stay in my house. Please take this N10K and look for a guest house and sleep, said the man. Thereafter, Jennifer went to her lover's house. Jennifer, what are you doing in my house? Have I not warned you not to step your feet in my compound? He asked. Please, Victor, allow me to sleep anywhere in your house. I don't have anywhere to go. My husband scammed me and sold everything I had and ran away with the money. Jennifer begged. That's just the beginning. You haven't seen anything. Jennifer, you can't enter my house. Your heart is full of evil. But I can only permit you to sleep in my gateman's room or my garage. The choice is yours, he replied. Please, Victor, allow me to sleep on your balcony, Jennifer begged with teary eyes. Madam, if you can't sleep in my gateman's house or garage, then get out of my compound. Okay. I will sleep in the gateman's house, but please tell your gateman not to touch me, said Jennifer. That's your business, not mine, the man replied. Jennifer didn't have any other option than to sleep in a gateman's house because she didn't have anywhere else to go. None of her family members were living in the same town as her, and she didn't have a good relationship with her family. All her family hated her because of her unpleasant behavior. As soon as daybreak, she took the 10K that the man gave her and went to a deadly shrine to make her husband go mad. Mysteriously, when she got there, the chief priest gave her a mysterious charm and instructed her to wake up at midnight and call the name of her husband, Evans, seven times. That Evans would run mad instantly and everything she lost would be restored. Jennifer left the shrine blissfully at midnight, she silently woke up and carried the mysterious charms and tiptoed to a backyard and called Evan's name seven times and said, Evans, wherever you are now, I command you to run mad mysteriously. After Jennifer did everything, she went back to the gateman's house and continued with her sleeping. And when she woke up in the morning, everybody was extremely shocked by what Jennifer suddenly transformed into. Write the word, continue in the comment section if you want a part 4. The final showdown and please subscribe to our channel.